We are delighted to introduce our speaker today, Jocelyn Grant, Senior Outreach and Learning Manager and Archivist in the National Records for Scotland's or NRS Outreach and Learning Department. In today's talk, Jocelyn will discuss the women's suffrage movement in Scotland, looking primarily at the period before 1918 and how it is represented in NRS's archives. In particular, the talk will cover the difference between suffragists and the suffragettes, notable individuals involved in the movement and the recent online resource produced by NRS, giving access to many of the archival files held within the NRS. Over to you, Jocelyn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tessa, and good evening, everybody. Many thanks for joining us uh, this evening. Um, as Tessa mentioned, my name is Jocelyn. I'm one of the archivists at the National Records of Scotland, and I work in the Outreach and Learning Department. My role is primarily concerned with making archives more accessible, and I work as part of a close team of three and in collaboration with other departments to produce a number of different access points to our collections. These include online articles, public talks, as well as learning workshops and events, including tours, tailored visits and exhibitions. At the National Records of Scotland, we hold the records of the nation. These include not only our government records, but also private deposited archives, maps and plans, the records of industries and many more. Today, the majority of the records I'll be speaking about are held within our government files, but there are also diaries, ephemera and newspaper reports, but a bit more about that later on. So in 2018, I created the exhibition Malicious Mischief, Women's Suffrage in Scotland to celebrate the centenary of some women gaining the vote, and it's why I'm speaking to you today. I'm going to give you a brief history of the women's suffrage movement in Scotland, dealing primarily with the period before 1918 and how this time is represented in particular in the archives of the National Records of Scotland. 2018 marked the centenary of some women gaining the parliamentary vote through the passing of the Representation of the People Act. This entitled women to vote as long as they had attained 30 years of age, were not subject to any legal incapacity and had a property qualification of not less than five pounds. This act passed in 1918, but campaigning began much earlier. Organised campaigning started in 1866 when John Stuart Mill presented the first mass women's suffrage petition to the House of Commons with over 1,500 signatures. He proposed an amendment to the Second Reform Act of 1867 that would enfranchise all householders regardless of their sex. It failed, but it proved to be the catalyst for organised campaigning. It was at this time that the first women's society in Edinburgh, the Edinburgh National Society for Women's Suffrage, was constituted and they started to campaign in earnest. Fun fact number one, this was the start of organized campaigning. The first petition ever submitted on women's suffrage was presented to parliament in 1832 by Henry Hunt MP. He did so on behalf of Mary Smith, a wealthy woman from Yorkshire. So from 1870 to 1884, a debate on women's suffrage took place almost every year in Parliament, and the movement grew as more women committed to the cause. These women became known as the suffragists. Now, suffragists pursued, pursued the parliamentary vote through constitutional means, such as peaceful protests, petitions and lobbying MPs. Suffragettes were suffragists who, impatient with the government's indifference to peaceful protests, had decided to take militant action. During the late 1800s, suffragist organisations quickly sprang up across Britain and the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, or the NUWSS, was formed to coordinate their efforts. A name you might recognise, Millicent Fawcett, served on their executive committee and became its president in 1907. You can see her here uh, speaking to the crowd. The NUWSS gathered together regional societies with no political party allegiance and that used peaceful tactics to work towards the vote. The leading suffragist represented in our records is Lady Frances Balfour. She served on the executive committee of the NUWSS from its formation in 1897 alongside Millicent Fawcett. 
In our archives, we hold Balfour's letters and diaries, which reveal her participation in many suffrage activities, including the peaceful NUWSS United Procession of Women of 1907, more commonly known as the Mud March because of the terrible weather, in which 40 suffragist societies and over 3,000 women marched from Hyde Park to Exeter Hall. They also reveal her thoughts on both peaceful and militant protests and the actions of the government in response. Although many suffragists were outspoken in their disapproval of militancy, suffragists and suffragettes often collaborated. Balfour's records reveal her mixed feelings on the situation and note some of the key events now remembered as part of the movement. I've selected here just a couple of examples from her letters. The first reads, I don't know whether I like the policy, but I do admire the courage and resource of the women in reference to the suffragettes. And the second states, things are so very difficult. I don't think anyone outside can realize how the mass of women are moving and how intensely they are in earnest and how really dangerous it is to play with the whole question, which is her response to the government's uh, attitude and uh, actions in response to women's suffrage. This here is an example of one of her diaries. We have tens of these uh, delicate little books. The example I've picked um, references the events of Derby Day and the death of Emily Wilding Davidson. It states, dined with Molly, balls there, Derby Day, winner disqualified. Miss Davidson SPU tried to destroy the race, touched King's horse, she is dead, the first blood, which perhaps also indicates where she thought the movement was going to go. Fun fact number two, suffragist colours were red, white and green. Red and white seem to have been used from as early as 1906, with green added in November 1909. These dates and articles written by suffragists seem to suggest that these colours were employed to distinguish them from their suffragette sisters. You may also notice that these are the colours of the Italian flag. This is intentional. An article in the suffragist paper, The Common Cause Notes, it may serve, among other things, to remind us that our colours are not a red and a white and a green, as yet unstoried and unhallowed, merely juxtaposed for the nonce to distinguish our union from another, but that they are already a living unity with a great signification and glorious history, for they have already served as the symbol of a battle for liberty, nobly fought and won. So the NUWSS 1907 procession was the first of several during the campaign, and it was a form of protest that advertised the sheer number of women agitating for the vote. Another well-known uh, form of passive agitation was the boycott of the 1911 census. Organized by the Women's Freedom League, or the WFL, the boycott was a form of civil dis disobedience and passive militancy. Believing that taxation without representation was a form of tyranny, the WFL encouraged all suffrage societies to participate in the boycott, either through evasion, so avoiding the notice of the enumerator, or resistance, straight up refusing to provide information. Our 1911 Scottish census records reveal precious evidence of this boycott. The enumerator would note individuals who refused to provide information as suffrage protesters. Others chose to make political points using their census returns. This here is one such example. A Miss MF Thompson uh, submitted and participated in the boycott by returning her census form blank, except for the words, no votes for women, no information from women. During the census resistance, many suffragists and suffragettes came together for nights of entertainment. In Edinburgh, Cafe Vegetaria was the main venue hired by the American activist, Lucy Burns. Although the census officials failed to get information from those attending, it appears that police uh, stood around the corner and counted those entering the building. Uh, our records note that they counted 159 women and 35 men, estimating that many were in their 20s. Now, the nature of the boycott means we do not know exactly how many women participated, although there are now researchers trying to establish this. However, it didn't really matter. The success lay more in the press attention that it received. Delighted with the suffragists' actions, the press published extensive details on why women were refusing to be counted and the entertainment that they organised for the occasion. This captured the public's imagination and further advertised the suffragists' aims. 
So the suffragists had been campaigning for several decades and progress was made as acts were passed which gave more rights to women in local elections. But in 1903, a new form of agitation was to come to the fore. Fed up with the slow progress, suffragettes appeared and were set to reinvigorate the movement. First used in the Daily Mail, in 1906, suffragette was a deliberately negative name given to those suffragists who, impatient with the government's continued indifference, had decided to take militant action. Coined as a term of derision, it was quickly appropriated as a badge of identity, distinguishing them from their suffragist sisters. The first militant action occurred in Manchester on the 13th of October 1905, when the Women's Social and Political Union, or the WSPU, interrupted a liberal political meeting by putting questions to the speaker on women's suffrage. Physically ejected from the meeting, one of the group, Christabel Pankhurst, spat in the face of a policeman and was arrested, gaining considerable publicity for the cause. Skilled at propaganda, the suffragettes conducted an impressive campaign that captured public attention. By destroying property, committing assaults and hunger striking, they created opportunities for their actions to be widely publicized. While this ensured that the cause remained in the public eye, as violent militancy escalated, their actions did draw strong criticism from both the public and suffragists for being unwomanly and detrimental to the cause. So did the suffragettes help? Well, in the National Records of Scotland, we hold a wealth of records about suffragette activities in Scotland, including their prosecution, imprisonment, newspaper reports, and details of the cases of force feeding. Through these records, we can find not only evidence of suffrage activities, we can also trace individuals and how they participated in the movement. So I've selected a couple of individuals that I think are particularly relevant. The first is Ethel Moorhead. One of the most infamous suffragettes in Scotland, Moorhead appears in our records under several aliases, under Edith Johnston, Mary Humphreys, or Margaret Morrison. Moorhead repeatedly made the papers through outrageous militant acts. This led to her being dubbed the Scottish leader of the suffragettes, despite no such position existing. Convicted a total of five times, Moorhead's antics allowed ample opportunity to advertise women's suffrage, as her arrest, her prosecution, release and re-arrest were all followed by the press. So I've listed here her convictions. The first is on the 7th of September 1912 under the alias Edith Johnston. She smashes the case that holds the William Wallace sword in Stirling, stating your liberties were won with the sword, our liberties are being won with stones and hammers. On the 2nd of November the same year as herself, Ethel Moorhead, she enters Broughton High School with a whip to attack a Mr. Peter Ross, a school teacher, in retaliation for him allegedly striking her at a public meeting. On the 3rd of December of the same year, this time under the alias Mary Humphreys, she throws a stone at a car, breaking its window. The car is carrying a Mrs. Crombie and two men. Moorhead thought the car held Lloyd George, who was the Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time. On the 4th of February, 1913, as Margaret Morrison, she throws pepper in the, a policeman's face and proceeds to smash 12 window panes in a police office and throw a bucket of water over a sergeant in the office. Um, and finally, on the 15th of October, 1913, again, under the alias Margaret Morrison, she's convicted of housebreaking and attempted fire raising in a mansion house in Glasgow. On the 19th of February, 1914, this is a re-arrest. Um, she's re-arrested after being released on license for her conviction on the 15th of October, 1913. Now, while the majority of the criminal case files record the actions of the government and their associated authorities, we do get wonderful glimpses into some of the suffragettes and their personalities. In the case of Moorhead, she wrote several complaints and petitions while imprisoned. This example here states, Sirs, my complaint against the governor is that he refused to take off his cap when he came into my cell today. I endeavoured, unsuccessfully, to remove it by slinging a slipper at it. Please arrange that I may have visits from friends, newspapers and books, etc., according to prison rules for suffragist prisoners. I should be glad if you would allow my doctor, Dr. Grace Caddle, to visit me. The governor and the doctor do not appear to me to be sober men, and as a ratepayer and taxpayer, I strongly object to men of this type in a position of respectability in our prisons. 
prison commissioners be compelled to make a better choice in future. At present, there is little to choose between bullies and drunks only in authority. So on the 15th of October, 1913, both Moorhead and suffragette Dorothea Chalmers Smith were convicted of housebreaking and attempted fire raising and sentenced to eight months imprisonment. This is an image here. You can see that Ethel Moorhead is the woman in the middle and Dorothea Chalmers Smith is on the right. They were discovered by a passing constable and found inside a house in Glasgow with incendiary materials. This slide here shows the postcards that were found at the scene of the crime and submitted as evidence. These bear a warning um, and a note as to why they've been left, a protest against Mrs. Pankhurst's rearrest, this one states, and this, beware the destruction of property, it's but the beginning. Both Muirhead and Smith immediately went on hunger strike and after five days fasting, they were released under the controversial Prisoners Temporary Discharge for Ill Health Act of 1913, also known as the Cat and Mouse Act. Once she recovered, Moorhead disappeared, but was rearrested in February 1914. Committed to Carlton Jail, Edinburgh, she became the first suffragette to be force fed in Scotland. Fun fact number three, the first woman to hunger strike was Marion Wallace Dunlop. A common misconception is that this act of protest was against women's lack of voting rights. It was actually to protest the authorities' refusal to classify her as a first division prisoner. This status was available to political prisoners and it afforded more rights, such as wearing their own clothes, writing letters and receiving visitors. Dunlop refused to eat until this status was recognized and the WSPU quickly adopted the strike as a form of protest. The authorities never granted suffragettes the political prisoner status. However, they were very wary of the bad press the death of a starving suffragette in prison would create. Despite this, they were unwilling to recognize the imprisonment of these women as political and the government was forced to release them. In 1910, in an attempt to appease the suffragettes, the then Home Secretary, Winston Churchill, introduced the catchily named Rule 243A. This allowed second and third division prisoners additional privileges. The measure temporarily succeeded before suffragettes resumed hunger striking and were normally released without completing their sentence. So while England had resorted to force feeding in 1909, it was widely believed that Scotland would not adopt this measure. In reality, Scottish authorities had been discussing the possibility of force feeding since 1909, but due to a number of circumstances, it was not carried out until 1914. As far as I'm aware, no suffragette served their full sentence when hunger striking, and the authorities were left in the embarrassing position of being unable to retain their prisoners. Force feeding was adopted in an attempt to supposedly keep the suffragette prisoners healthy enough to serve the duration of their sentence, but it was ineffective. Moorhead was force fed for only four days of her remaining eight month sentence before being released with double pneumonia. According to press reports and official memos, Suffragette Dr. Grace Caddell attributed this diagnosis to food entering her lungs through improper feeding. However, the medical officer responsible, Dr. Ferguson Watson, who is responsible for the majority of force feeding in Scotland, he furiously denied this. He claimed that Moorhead subjected herself to the possibility of getting a chill by smashing her cell windows and being inappropriately dressed. The reaction of suffrage campaigners, those sympathetic to the cause, as well as press reports, reveal the outrage and disappointment at the actions of the authorities. I have selected one such letter that was sent to uh, the Scottish authorities, which I feel encapsulates this anger. Dr. Devon, sir, can let me congratulate you. You have kept your duty to send out this woman in such a condition as to be unable to do anything, either for herself or others. You have done your duty and quickly too. Not all the expert skill you spoke of has availed to keep her under torture very long. You've had it proved to you that Sir Victor Horsley and Mr. Manzel Mullen are right about forcible feeding when they say there is great risk to the victim. You have proved this even when the operation is performed by skilled operators, yet you have done your duty. So did those who drove in the nail and cavalry. So did those who let loose the lions in ancient Rome. 
So did those who lit the faggots round Joan of Arc. So did those who tortured or slaughtered our covenanting forefathers. So did the tools and sycophants of every tyrant since the world began. This may seem very extravagant language. It fits the circumstances. A woman came into your hands. She was in normal health and vigor. In one short week, she is carried out. How? As the victims of old were carried out of the wreck chamber, broken and helpless. Yes, you have kept your word. You have done your duty well. Are you satisfied? Signed off from Elizabeth Gold. This anger would be further stoked by the treatment of Francis Gordon and Fanny Parker. In 1914, Francis Gordon was convicted in Glasgow High Court of housebreaking with intent to set fire and sentenced to 12 months imprisonment. I've selected Gordon's case because it stands out due to her treatment by Dr. Ferguson Watson in Perth prison. Gordon vomited and retched shortly after admission and the decision to force feed her was delayed. The doctor's daily notes describe Gordon as of a highly neurotic and hysterical temperament and they detail her talking about tubes and feeding in her sleep. The effects of feeding are recorded in quite chilling detail. Um, Gordon's difficulty in breathing once the feeding tube had been inserted into what they describe as her very narrow pharynx and nasal passage, as well as how much of the food was thrown back up are all clinically detailed. Unable to successfully feed her orally, the doctor proposed to feed her per bowel and Gordon was given a nutrient enema of egg and milk. This form of feeding, supplemented by additional feeding by tube, continued for four days before the doctor conceded that the prisoner's condition was beginning to cause anxiety. Dr. Ferguson Watson concludes his report by admitting that Gordon was not suitable for force feeding, but that he could not have known this until after a careful trial. The doctor appears to have failed to anticipate the fury and criticism that reports of Gordon's treatment would generate. Questions were raised in the House of Commons and the authorities scrambled to explain the treatment and poor conditioner of the prisoner upon release. Our files show that the, the authorities appear to have convinced themselves that Gordon had undergone systematic drugging before admittance to prison. There is even correspondence, which I can show you here, um, which references a rumour at Scotland Yard that suffragettes had smuggled in pills in the form of buttons that they could then take in prison to induce sickness. However, there's no hard evidence of this, at least not recorded in our archives. In response to the unexpected scrutiny his actions attracted, Dr Ferguson Watson claims to have suspected this drugging from the start. However, we know from his notes, from Gordon's entry until her release, he makes no mention of this if he did suspect it. The next woman I'd like to look at is Fanny Parker, an organiser for the WSPU in Dundee. Parker had been imprisoned on several occasions for damaging property. Using the alias Janet Arthur, she appeared in air court on the 9th of July, 1914, accused of attempting to blow up Robert Burns's cottage. She refused to enter the dock or to recognise the court's jurisdiction and Parker was committed to air prison pending further inquiry. She immediately went on hunger strike and after four days was transferred to Perth prison to be force fed, still untried. Despite the furore that Gordon's treatment had recently caused, Parker was judged fit for feeding, and this once again was done and attempted by rectum. This occurred seven times over the following four days before her family intervened. She was the niece of Lord Kitchener, who you might recognise. And the files show that her brother, Captain Parker, contacted and negotiated with the authorities for her release, whilst making clear that he did not uh, agree with his sister's pers pursuit of women's suffrage. Parker is unique in that her family was influential enough to arrange for a second independent doctor to examine her. In comparison to Dr. Ferguson Watson's reports that her condition was satisfactory, the comments of Dr. Chalmers Watson are very different, stating that Parker was in a state of pronounced collapse. The comments on her condition and the apparent damage done to Parker's genitals in the process of force feeding indicate a clear distaste for this method of treatment. Fanny Parker was never tried in court and was released from prison due to the inquiries made by her family, but many were not so fortunate. The last woman I'd like to look at is Arabella Scott, 
Arabelle Scott was also one of the few suffragettes force fed in Scotland. She was the only one to have endured that treatment for over a month. Scott's experience, as well as the rest of these wreckers, raised questions over the actions of the authorities and whether they employed force feeding as a form of punishment. Scott initially became involved in the women's suffrage movement through the Women's Freedom League, the WFL. Arabella and her sister Muriel were both active speakers for the WFL. In July 1909, they were charged with obstruction for attempting to present a petition to the Prime Minister in London and sentenced to 21 days imprisonment in Holloway Prison. Despite this, they continued to campaign, hoping that reasoned argument would soon win women the vote. However, at some point between 1909 and 1911, the sisters appear to have switched their allegiance to the WSPU. Scott and three other women attempted to burn down the grandstand at Kelso Racecourse. She was convicted on the 19th of May, 1913 and sentenced to nine months imprisonment in Colton Jail. She immediately went on hunger strike and on the 24th of May was liberated under the Cat and Mouse Act. Based on her release after five days, Scott did calculate that to serve her full sentence, she would need to go to prison 65 times. Now, Scott continued to campaign with the WSPU, but she did not undertake any other forms of militancy. She also never returned to prison voluntarily upon expiry of each license and had to be rearrested several times. Our archives in the National Records of Scotland provide a really tantalizing insight into her interactions with the authorities. After her fifth rearrest, Scott was force fed for over four weeks. Dr. Ferguson Watson's notes give honestly quite an upsetting account of the process. Although he frequently recorded that Scott made no active resistance and that she was fit for further treatment, the description of her actions seemed to contradict these statements. So I've selected a few examples. This first one here states, I beg to report the prisoner named on the margin, Arabella C. Scott, requires the following number of warders to control her on medical requisition. Three warders uh, during the day and two at night. On each occasion when being fed, five and it's time six warders for one hour and four warders for another hour. I believe this was to hold her down during feeding and afterwards apparently to aid digestion. The other example I have is a telling addition made to Dr. Ferguson Watson's records stating Scott has on two separate occasions, which unfortunately I forgot to record, stated in front of several wardresses and myself that she would shoot me when she got out. Within a few days of her coming here, she bit my left forefinger and it became septic and it remained so for over a week. None of these reports seem particularly consistent with an apparently passive prisoner. Throughout her incarceration, Dr. Ferguson Watson made sure that Scott received no letters or visits from her friends or relatives, was unable to request a lawyer or to send a petition to the Secretary of State, and that she should not receive a copy of the prison rules. These restrictions were imposed to avoid unnecessary excitement that, according to the doctor, would hinder treatment. Correspondence in our Scottish office files reveal that even Scott's mother appears not to have been informed as to her whereabouts. This letter states, if my daughter had been a murderer, I would have known her whereabouts. I, her mother, demand to know where you are hiding her. Given these statements and the lack of success that force feeding had ensuring suffragists serve their sentence, it is difficult to see this method as anything other than a form of punishment. After the outbreak of the war with Germany, the government released all suffragette prisoners and the WSPU activities were suspended. Uh, after the outbreak of war for suffrage, action for suffrage was mostly set aside. While some suffragists joined anti-war groups, most women campaigners diverted their energy and organizational skills into supporting servicemen's families, nursing and other voluntary work. The Scottish Women's Hospital, founded by Dr. Elsie Inglis, were among the more remarkable humanitarian and patriotic efforts. Women replaced men in many workplaces across Britain, for example, as tram drivers and workers in factories, and even in heavy engineering. Change came in 1917, when it was realised that millions of servicemen would be returning home only to find that they were technically barred from voting. Lloyd George, Lloyd George's government was forced to remove the property qualification for male voters and they initiated conferences on women's suffrage. 
on being consulted, the NUWSS and the WFL reluctantly agreed to a minimum age of 30 and property qualifications. These were the main conditions of women's enfranchisement in the representation of the People Act, which came into force on the 6th of February 1918. This here is an image from the 2018 uh, women's suffrage procession in Edinburgh that celebrated the centenary. Um, you won't be able to tell who, but our colleagues are in the bottom right corner and we were there as well. It was a wonderful day and an excellent celebration. After the uh, war, peaceful agitation did continue. In 1928, Parliament passed the Equal Franchise Act, which opened the vote to all women and men over the age of 21. It was the culmination of decades of campaigning and a fitting achievement for the suffrage cause in all its manifestations. So to end today's talk, um, at the beginning of this year, we released online a mini website that was based on this exhibition and dedicated to the records we have relating to women's suffrage. So I'm going to show you the site. So this here is the National Records of Scotland website. If you go to the research section here and click on learning, there's an exhibition section, which also houses our exhibition resources. Currently, we have too many websites based on past exhibitions. The women's suffrage is the second one here. So this originally started its life as really a computer housing the images of our full files relating to the suffragettes hosted in the exhibition space. Since then, it has been expanded. We have added uh, profiles for the women represented in the National Records of Scotland's archives. So do bear in mind this specifically reflects what we hold in the archives. If you click on any of these, you will get a short biography, a photograph or image if we've been able to find one, and a link to the relevant file that women is represented in in our collections. There's also a timeline, <coughs> excuse me, of women's suffrage um, from 8032 onwards. This records some of the key um, acts that were attempted, petitions. Um, it also notes the uh, criminal cases in our files. So if you go to 1912 onwards, you will see a massive increase in militancy. Where possible, we have linked to, the, again, the relevant files in our holdings and also externally to resources that might be useful. So for instance, this here, if you click on it, will take you to legislation.gov.uk. It is a record keeper's paradise, and it would allow you to read the act in your own time if you wanted to see the full details. It also has full images of the files related to suffragettes. So you'll see here their names, the HHN number, that is the archive reference. Um, and if you click into any of these, you'll be presented with the full image of the file. You can also click into the image for a more detailed photograph. And at the bottom, there is a summary of the information that document contains. So you can also look through these at your own leisure. The 1911 census evaders, these are selected transcriptions from a letter book concerning the 1911 census and the attempts by individual registers to gather the necessary information. You may notice Ethel Moorhead is listed here. Um, you might have understood from um, her convictions and her actions, she seems to have been quite a character. I would highly recommend you read the transcriptions relating to the registers attempts to get information from Ethel Moorhead because she gives them quite a difficult time. Finally, the about section just explains why this was created and what the images can be used for. So that is the talk today. Um, I've put up here the full uh, website address for that mini site to do with suffrage if you'd like to investigate it, as well as my email address if anyone has any further questions or would like to discuss anything after this talk, I would certainly be very happy to hear from you. Thank you very much for listening.